Welcome to the colourful world of the early 19th century British soldier in the age of the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon. As you can see, uniforms were designed to be colourful, impressive, both in battle, but more importantly at home, on parade. As you could see from the clip, soldiers fought standing shoulder to shoulder. And with weapons such as the musket, with an effective accurate range of only 80 yards, there was no real point in camouflage uniforms of the like we have today. <laughs> of course, one of the most colourful elements of the British uniform is the traditional red coat. There are many reasons given for the choice of red, ranging from because it doesn't show the colour of blood in battle, through to, well, you can see a soldier through the swirling clouds of gunpowder smoke on a battlefield. But none of these are actually right. What we have is a decision made in 1645 during the English Civil War when Parliament raised the new model army. Previous to that, regiments of the army had had their own colours, for instance, Prince Rupert's blue coats, Newcastle's whites. But what they wanted was a standard colour. Didn't really care too much what it was. And they chose madder red, this dark brick red, because it was a cloth that was readily available in London and as it was a traditional madder herb dye, it was cheap. And cheapness is something governments all like. Now, uh, regiments were all different. At the height of the Napoleonic War, there were over a hundred of them. And each regiment sought to have a different uniform. And one of the main distinctions was what we call facing colours. Here we have the collar and the cuffs, bring the cuff up there, a dark green. This is the 11th North Devon Regiment. But of course, there were green, blue, yellow, purple and black in small numbers, but clearly not a hundred separate colours. So what they did was they produced differences in the uniform. As you can see on the front of the jacket, there is some lacing and each regiment had its own lace, its shape of lace. These ones are known as bastions, others of them were just square. And of course, here you can see the soldier's tunic is double buttons. So every regiment had its unique features. One of the infamous parts of the 19th century soldier's uniform was the stock around the neck. In the military case, it was leather. Once again, this was a reflection of civilian fashion. People wore stocks around their, their necks, but they were mostly cloth. But in the case of the military, it was a thick piece of leather that went around the neck with a clasp at the back and was designed to keep the soldier's head up and stop him from looking too much to the left and the right. This is really a reflection of the fashion, the military fashion born of Frederick the Great during the middle of the 18th century, still hanging on. And you can imagine how difficult it was to wear one of these in the heat of the Spanish peninsula. The other important element of a uniform is, of course, the soldier's leg wear. Well, this was a change in fashion at this time. The old 18th century breeches were being progressively replaced by pantaloons and finally, as we see here, trousers. And this was the example of the military following civilian fashion. Very much uh, the case. And the jacket, as you can see, high-waisted trousers and a highly cut uh, jacket. Once again, a reflection of civilian fashion coming into military uniform. With 
King George safely out of the way and the Prince of Wales, now Prince Regent, having taken over, he could really dictate what the army wore and the Prince Regent just loved his uniforms, particularly Hussar uniforms. A military fashion came originally from Hungary but had become popular across Europe. And one of the things he changed was the cap. So if you take that one off and put this one on, there we have a very different design. It's known as a Belgic uh, cap. And once again, it was not regarded particularly well by the soldiers. It wasn't very robust and it collapsed and looked like nothing on earth. Another thing that uh, changed during this time were soldiers' shoes. Traditional, as you can see, they're square lasted, i.e. Uh, you put them on either foot. And in fact, the soldiers were encouraged to change them over so that the wear on the shoes would be even. These were actually replaced, and this is practicality now, by the first pairs of boots, complete with metal studs on the bottom. A soldier obviously needed equipment for battle and the first item we have to put on over the top through the arm there is his haversack. This contained his, uh, his food uh, essentially. The next one, so we've got food. We now have ammunition. That one goes over this side, like so. And that's on his rear hip, so he can reach down and get it. Next item with, once again, a little bit of regimentalia on it, a cross belt plate, is his bayonet. And finally, we have the water bottle, famous blue water bottle. Finally, of all the equipment, we have the soldier's knapsack. This would contain spare clothing, spare soles for his shoes, his washing kit, and everything he would need to live on campaign. Early in the period, this was crushingly heavy, and soldiers during the retreat to Karana describe it as a living death sentence. But as the war went on, less and less was to be found in here. A blanket and a handful of real essentials. So let's put it on. So there we go, through there, through there, and up we go. And then we have these cross straps here, which once the weight is, is in this knapsack, it really did uh, restrict the soldiers uh, breathing. Uh, not designed ergonomically like modern mountain equipment or indeed military equipment as it is today, but very basic thin straps that cut into the shoulder rather than spreading the weight. The life of a soldier in the early 19th century was never easy.